Hi, my name is Rick Bloodworth. I want to talk to you today about a man by the name of Ben Hogan. For those of you who are golf enthusiasts, you'll know that he was one of the greatest golfers of all time. But like all great men, he started off with humble beginnings. He was born in 1912 around Fort Worth, Texas. Had a, had a really a nice life up until uh, the point that he was 12 years old. And it was when he was 12, his dad, from, who was suffering a terrible bout of depression, uh, shot himself in, in the chest. And while his dad survived for a few hours after that and was able uh, to tell his family how sorry he was and that he wished he hadn't done it, it was just too late. And the Hogan's family uh, was absolutely changed after that. Ben's mother was a very good seamstress, and while she was able to get employment, it really wasn't enough to make ends meet. So Ben went in uh, to the city to sell newspapers. Now, Ben was a really small boy. As a matter of fact, he was small all of his life. Uh, but he had a passion uh, for making sure that, that he was doing his part. And so he jumped right in. The newspaper business was very competitive. You had to fight to get the best locations to where you could sell the most newspapers. And so Ben just did just that. And he got to the point where he was selling newspapers in a pretty good location. And he came across some information during that time that down the road a few miles was a golf course. And at that golf course, there were boys there that made 65 cents a round just to carry golf clubs around for the rich men who were golfing there. And Ben Hogan thought, I need to try that. And so he went down to that golf course, and if he thought the newspaper uh, selling business was competitive, the caddy uh, business was even more so, and the older boys really uh, kept him down. And, and he kept on going back, and they kept beating him up. Uh, but he kept on fighting to the point where finally he won their respect, and he won a position within their ranks, and he was able to start caddying. And while he was caddying, not only was he earning this incredible sum of 65 cents for every round uh, that he carried the golf clubs in, but he also started gaining uh, a desire for the game. It looked like a, a fun game. Now, he certainly couldn't afford it, but over the next year, he started buying him a set of golf clubs, one golf club at a time. And while it wasn't a matching set, it was still a set. And he started to practice. And he became pretty good. He entered in the caddy tournaments. And other than one caddy that just always beat him, he was doing very well. So well, in fact, that he started saving up his money and entering the larger tournaments. And while it took him a while to gain success, he always uh, had had a confidence that he could do it if he would just practice hard enough. And eventually he became good enough to where he started placing in the money in some of these tournaments, even winning some of these, some of these tournaments. And now for the first time in his life, he actually had a little bit of money. He was not uh, impoverished anymore. Well, he had left home by this time, and he met a girl by the name of Valerie, and they got married, and Valerie was the love of Ben Hogan's life. And she was very supportive of what he was doing. She would uh, follow him to the golf tournaments and was always there by his side through, through his travels. And Ben just got better and better. So much so that he became one of the top golfers in the world. By World War II, uh, he was maybe the best that the world knew. Well, he did his time in World War II, and he came back and, and again just picked up where he left off and was one of the top golfers, if not the top golfer uh, in the world, and things were going very well for them. There was something about Ben that always uh, seemed to hold him back, though, and that was his personality. Because he had grown up in such uh, a tough climate, he was really reserved. As a matter of fact, he was painfully shy. And though fans would come out and cheer for him and ask him for his autograph, he paid them no mind. He wanted to focus on his game, and he never even indicated that he knew they were there. Well, not only did this not sit well with the fans, it didn't sit very well with the press corps either. And so 
Ben Hogan got a pretty bad reputation. He became known as the Texas Iceberg. But he didn't care. He was doing well in golf. He was famous. He was making money. He was married to the woman that he loved. Things were going well until February of 1949 when he and his wife were driving back home and, and it was in the fog and he was rounding a turn coming up to a bridge and he noticed that there was a bus coming straight at him in his lane trying to pass a truck on the other side. Well, he couldn't move over far enough to avoid him because there was a safety rail on that bridge. And so Ben threw himself across Valerie to try and shield her from the impact. And the collision was quite serious. Well, Valerie was able to walk away from the accident virtually unscathed, Ben was at death's doorstep. He had broken uh, his leg, he had broken his shoulder, he had broken an ankle, a rib. His pelvis, pelvis was crushed. His internal uh, organs were not functioning correctly. And he was in the hospital for quite some time. Well, it was during this time that people uh, heard the news of it and started sending letters of support to, to Ben and to Valerie. Ben later on said that, that he had received thousands of letters from people he didn't know, all people from all walks of life, from housewives to businessmen to farmers, just, just anybody. But the message was always the same. We're praying for you. We hope that you recover well. Well, nobody expected Ben uh, to be able to play golf again. They weren't even certain that he'd ever get up out of his hospital bed, but Ben was encouraged by this. And he fought hard and worked hard to get up out of that hospital bed. And then for the next year, he worked hard to be able to play golf again. Now he could not walk without excruciating pain and he had, had to really uh, take care of himself just to get to the point where he could walk. But, but walk he did and play he did. He entered a tournament in Los Angeles and and he was obviously quite the story on his comeback. And he approached the first tee and the fans, the crowd just went wild. And then Ben did something he had never done before. He smiled the warmest, most gracious smile that you could imagine to show his appreciation for them. And he was a changed man after that. He treated people much, much better. And he was still shy. But you could tell he really appreciated what had been done for him. Well, he was able to play for probably another oh, three or four years. He even won some major tournaments during that time. He was voted the Comeback Golfer of the Year uh, in 1951 for his achievements. Finally, he had to retire in 1953. He just couldn't walk a golf course anymore. But again, he was, he was a different man. Somebody came and asked him, did an interview with him, what was the change in you? And he told him that while he was lying uh, in that hospital bed, not sure that he'd ever get up out of that bed, and, and he and his wife would read those beautiful letters from complete strangers, letting them know that they were rooting for him and they were praying for him to get well. It just changed his attitude. And he said, because they showed so much faith in me, I had to, in turn, show faith towards them. And while I don't know that you could say that Ben Hogan was ever a, a, a real serious Christian, he certainly was a man of faith. And, and he was a man who appreciated the fact that God gave him a second chance. In Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 13, it says this, Blessed is the man who finds wisdom, the man who gains understanding, for she is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. Well, Ben Hogan gained wisdom and he gained understanding. And as nice as the fame and the money was before his accident, it was nothing compared to the wisdom and the depth of appreciation that he had for God and for those who had been praying for him. And it was, far worth, it was worth far more to him than any gold or silver or trophy that he could have obtained. In Proverbs 29, 23, it says, A man's pride brings him low, but a man of lowly spirit gains honor. Well, Ben Hogan was not just 
disliked, but by many people he was just absolutely despised. They thought him proud, and maybe to a certain degree he was proud, and it's interesting because our pride, which we think will lift us up, is something that will always bring us down, and God points out that a man's pride brings him low, but a man of lowly spirit gains honor. And it was when Ben Hogan humbled himself and recognized his need and his appreciation towards others that he really did start to gain honor. I like the way the King James Version puts the 108th Psalm. The first verse, it says, O oh God, my heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise, even with my glory. Ben Hogan went from being absolutely fixed on fame and fortune to having his heart fixed towards God and his fellow men. And he was more than willing to exchange the glory that he had had uh, for what God had done for him. And so he did praise God and he praised his fellow man because of that. It changed his life, may have saved his soul, we don't know. But what an interesting turn of events that he had when he came to realize that this life is very fleeting and that fame and fortune really just aren't what, what uh, they may be cracked up to be. And, and it wasn't until he was lying at death's doorstep that he really began to appreciate all this and gain a heart of understanding. Uh, there's a side story to this as well, this caddy that, that um, Ben Hogan could never seem to beat that was from Fort Worth also. His name was Byron Nelson. And Byron Nelson was a good Christian man. He was also one of the greatest golfers of all time. I think on the all-time PGA Tour victory list, uh, Ben Hogan was fourth all time and, and Byron Nelson was sixth. There was somebody that was going to visit Byron Nelson, a fan of his, a lifelong fan, when hmm, By Byron was probably uh, over 90 years old and he, he went uh, to the town and they told him maybe they could get some information as to where he lived at the church that he attended. He went to a little church uh, of Christ there and and so the, the man went there and well there was just a janitor there sweeping out the building and, and he asked him, do you know um, uh, Byron Nelson? Do you know where he lives? And the janitor said, well as a matter of fact he did because he was Byron Nelson. <laughs> And the man asked him, why are you doing sweeping out the building? And Byron Nelson's humble reply was, well, this is a small church and we all have our part to do. And even though Byron Nelson was a millionaire, he was willing to humble himself uh, to do the smallest job. Byron Nelson and his wife would often travel in the same golf caravan that Ben Hogan and Valerie would travel in. And while Ben and Byron never became great friends, Valerie and Byron's wife became the closest of friends. And it's no doubt that the faith of the Nelsons very much impacted the Hogans as Ben was going through all that he went through. How about you? Are there things in your life that maybe you're proud of, of your accomplishments? I think it's good to take proper satisfaction in our accomplishments. But it does seem like sometimes our focus is too much on fame and too much on money. And while it, we all need money to live and we would all like to have a little bit left over to do some of the things that we would like to do, sometimes we get so fixed upon fame and fortune that we forget what's really important. Ben Hogan was really fixed upon fame and fortune. And in about a, a period of just a few seconds, he learned that that was not enough. And as he was lying on what he thought might be his deathbed, he learned what really was important, and he started focusing and fixing his heart on the things that were truly important. It shouldn't take a near-death experience for us to be able to fix our hearts and our minds upon God. Many of you already have your, your heart fixed upon God, and that's good. But if you're like the rest of us, and you are struggling from time to time to maybe obtain your own glory, then like the psalmist said, this is by the way King David, who wrote this 108th Psalm, that we need to give God the praise, and that we need to give Him the glory 
and our heart needs to be fixed upon Him. If we can do that, we can obtain all sorts of different things in life that men seek after. But if our main focus is God, then we're going to do pretty well. And if our focus after God is upon our fellow men and helping them along the way, then we're going to do really, really good. The question is, will we wake up in time if we have our, our hearts fixed on the wrong thing? Jesus said this in the 16th uh, chapter of Matthew in verse 26. He said, What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? Well, Ben Hogan was on the route of giving in exchange for his soul fame and fortune, and he found out that it wasn't nearly enough. And so he transferred uh, his focus from the physical to the spiritual, and from selfish pursuits to the needs of other people. It's when we start appreciating God for, for what He's done for us and when we start appreciating our fellow men that life really becomes what God intended it for us uh, to be. And it's once we start living the life that God intended that we really can start helping other people. Where is your focus? Do you have a heart of wisdom? Is it upon God? If it is, keep on going. But if it's not, consider a change because it will be a change that will certainly uh, change your entire life, and then there will be heaven. Thanks for tuning in. I appreciate it. We'll see you next time, but until then, I pray that God will richly bless you as you seek to serve Him to the best of your ability.